In this YouTube video, I give an overview and demonstration of a piece of vintage test equipment, the Precision Apparatus Company E200C Signal Generator. Signal generators are electronic devices that generate repeating or non-repeating electronic signals and are used in designing, testing, troubleshooting, and repairing electronic devices. Radio frequency or RF signal generators are capable of producing frequencies in the range used for radio receivers. RF signal generators are used for servicing and aligning radio receivers. The Precision Apparatus Company, Inc. was founded in 1932 and was a manufacturer of test equipment and radio crystals. It was based at various times in Glendale, Elmhurst, and Brooklyn, New York. They also offered test equipment in kit form under the name PECO. In the 1960s, they were bought out by B&K, which then operated under the name BK Precision and is still in business today. The oscilloscope I will be using in the demonstration is a modern BK Precision unit. The E200C was a popular RF signal generator built in the 1940s and 50s. The circuit diagram for the unit I have is dated 1949. I found a reference that listed the retail price in the first year of sale at $71. It can generate radio frequencies in six ranges. Band A, 90 to 250 kilohertz. Band B, 220 to 600 kilohertz. Band C, 550 to 1700 kilohertz, the AM broadcast band. Band D, 1.6 to 5 megahertz. Band E, 4.2 to 12 megahertz. And band F, 9 to 30 megahertz. Band F can also be used on the second and third harmonics of the fundamental frequency and is marked on the dial as ranges F1 from 18 to 60 megahertz and F2 from 36 to 120 megahertz. There are low and high level outputs with controls for adjusting the output level. The level's not calibrated. On my unit, the high level is about 1 volt peak to peak and the low level is about 0.2 volts peak to peak with the output level control set to maximum into an open circuit. RF output can be unmodulated or amplitude modulated with a 400 hertz sine wave with adjustable modulation level marked in percent modulation. Modulation can also come from an external audio input source. It can directly output the 400 hertz sine wave audio signal with an adjustable output level. There's an AVC voltage output which produces an adjustable negative DC voltage up to about minus 50 volts. I'll explain the purpose of this later. The design is two-based using three vacuum tubes. Inside the heavy metal case, it uses a pretty standard metal chassis with the larger parts mounted on it. It utilizes three tubes, a power transformer, and a tuning capacitor. Most wiring is on the underside of the chassis. The line filter and output attenuators are housed in separate copper shielded compartments. The phase shifting network for the audio oscillator is also housed in a shielded can. The band switch has an interesting physical layout that minimized lead lengths. They call this their unit oscillator construction. I have replaced the original electrolytic and wax paper capacitors with new ones as these often fail on electronics of this vintage. Let's see a demonstration of the unit operating. I've connected the output to an oscilloscope so we can visually see it. We're now looking at the RF output on range C at approximately 1 megahertz. As you can see, it's not a pure sine wave. This was actually desired as the unit is intended to produce harmonics above the fundamental frequency so it could be used beyond 30 megahertz. The two level controls act like coarse and fine adjustments and affect the output from both the high and low level outputs. If we switch to band D, the output goes to about 2.8 megahertz. If we switch the mode to modulated RF, we can amplitude modulate the signal. Let's turn the sweep frequency of the scope down so we can see the RF envelope. Now we switch to modulated RF. As we increase the modulation, we can see the signal amplitude modulated at 400 hertz. 
It can also be modulated with an external audio input. Switching to the 400 cycle audio mode, we can see the 400 hertz sine wave output. The level's adjustable and goes up to approximately 115 volts RMS without a load. This signal is useful for testing the audio stages of a radio receiver or amplifier, for example. Finally, the AVC voltage produces a negative voltage which varies with the AVC control. This is somewhat unique, and the purpose is explained in the manual. Precision promoted a method of alignment they called the AVC substitution method. The idea was that automatic volume control, or AVC action, affects the behavior of receiver circuits. Normal practice is to align with the lowest possible signal to minimize AVC action. Precision argued that this is not realistic as most receivers operate with some AVC action. Their system was during alignment to inject an artificial AVC voltage that was comparable to what the receiver would experience in typical operation. This would, in theory, align the receiver more accurately. It meant using an AVC voltage generated by the signal generator. During alignment, the receiver-generated AVC line would need to be cut temporarily and the generator AVC voltage applied. In practice, I doubt that this method was used often. It meant the extra steps of cutting the AVC line, injecting a hopefully appropriate AVC voltage, and restoring the AVC line when done. I think it was more of a gimmick to differentiate the signal generator from competing products. You could also use the AVC output for other purposes like a B or grid bias power supply or testing capacitors for leakage. Different versions of the E200 and E200C were produced over the years. It was even followed by a solid state unit, the E200D. Depending on the model and serial number, at least five different circuit variations were used, and some later E200C versions had different packaging and features. This unit was given to me in my teens from a friend and mentor around 1977. I've had this longer than any other piece of test equipment. When received, it worked, and I used it to learn about radio and electronics and for testing and aligning a number of radios over the years. I recapped it and calibrated it a few years ago. On my unit, the 6C5 tube was replaced by a 6J5 GT. Someone wrote on the chassis with a grease pen, OK, December 6, 76. I suspect this was the gentleman who gave it to me since the date was not long before I got it. I replaced the original output connectors from a microphone type to more modern BNC connectors. Originally the unit would have come with a cable and probes. I don't think I ever had these. I also replaced the line cord with a new one. There should be a leather carrying handle. Mine was broken so I removed it. Two of the knobs are not original. It's very hard to tell as the replacement knobs are pretty much identical with the others. I don't have the original manual, but found various versions on the internet. Note that different circuits were used at various times. You can select the right schematic based on the unit's serial number. The E200C was a popular RF signal generator produced from the 1940s through the 1960s. While the manual discusses FM and TV applications, on its own it was really only suitable for AM and shortwave radio work. While it can't compare to the accuracy and small size of modern microprocessor-controlled and synthesized generators, it's still quite usable for radio alignment work, and it's a testament to the original designers that this unit and many like it are still working after over 60 years. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out my other YouTube videos on vintage amateur radio and test equipment.